Rick with Smart Drive Test talking to you today about preventing crashes. So we're going to talk about the types of crashes that you could be involved in and strategies and techniques that you could put in place to reduce, greatly reduce the risk of being involved in those crashes. Stick around. We'll be right back with that information. Hi there Smart Drivers, welcome back. Rick with Smart Drive Test talking to you today about crash prevention, keeping yourself safe. And the presentation that I'm going to do today is the first lesson in the defensive driving course. So you can head over to the Smart Drive Test website and pick that up and do the other lessons in the defensive driving course and will really help you to stay safe on the roadway and reduce your chances of being involved in a crash. So there's quite a number of people here already. Uh, we're a little bit later today because actually I was doing some truck training in Sam and Arm uh, with Jake there. Jake is going for his road test in the morning and unfortunately <laughs> things did not go as planned. Uh, the truck broke down, one of the airlines came off and unfortunately the truck was stuck because we couldn't get air pressure into the truck and the brakes wouldn't release without air pressure so that was unfortunate for Jake. So I'm hoping that Jake is doing well and is able to get the truck, get another truck and do his road test in the morning because uh, he was he just needed a bit of tuning up and uh, he was more or less ready to go there in salmon arm so katie's here from arkansas sunday is listening from seattle sam is here and ready to go carrie's here as well checking in from minnesota and she says thank happy thanksgiving it's thanksgiving here in canada and it'll be next month for those of you in the united states tim is here from winnipeg and rich is here uh, from maine conceda is here Excellent. So lots of people here uh, getting ready to do the presentation on crash prevention. As I said, this is the first lesson in the defensive driving course. Uh, you can look at that over at the Smart Drive Test website. And I'm going to extend the sale for past your road test first time uh, this week. So have a look at that as well. And if you're just tuning in as well, hit that thumbs up button. Let us know where you're in from. Uh, Gamma Integral is here as well. Jaden is here from Florida. Awesome. Lots of people here. And uh, as I said, let us know where you're tuning in. Let us know what class of license you're going for and we'll be able to help you out with getting a license, passing a road test and knowing what requirements you have for all of that. As well, the other reason you don't wanna be involved in a crash, as I said in the title, is you want to keep your insurance premiums low. And we talked about this a couple of weeks ago when we talked about the novice phase of the GDL program, the graduated driver's license, which all new drivers are going to be uh, entered into as part and parcel of getting your driver's license and you're going to spend approximately somewhere between 180 days and one year in the learner's phase where you have to be with a mentor another driver who has a license and then you're going to do an on-road test and you're going to graduate to the novice phase most novice phase uh, have a duration of two years and in that two years, you're going to pay a higher penalty for speeding tickets, uh, insurance premiums, uh, penalties are a lot higher and those types of things. So you want to try and get out of the novice phase as quickly as possible and move on to a full license. And the reason for that is because you're going to reduce your insurance premiums. Uh, the case study that I did two weeks ago when I talked about DUIs is, is that if you get a DUI and you lose your license in the novice phase, not only is your, your, your two-year period reset, which is unfortunate because now you're going to have to pay two years of higher premiums, but you're going to have to pay higher insurance premiums. That was my other point about that as well. Okay, so Casita is here, Toronto, Canada. Excellent. Uh, Nitka is here. David is here. I'm watching from New York, New Hampshire. Excellent. New Hampshire, excellent place. Mike is watching from... Fraser BC so we got lots of people here from BC and, and on the East Coast and whatnot and Sam excellent all right so I'm gonna move over to the presentation and we'll get going on that and as I said again uh, just remind you that this is uh, just get my right screen here going that this is the first lesson in the defensive driving course and Deandria, I'm not saying that right, I do apologize. Passed my G test Thursday, thanks Rick for pro providing quality content. You're absolutely most welcome. That is awesome news that you got your full license there in Ontario. And where did you go for your first uh, road trip? So we'll come back and we'll answer questions. Any questions you have after the presentation, I'll answer any questions you have. 
Again, Pash Road Test, first time is on for $27 over at the Smart Drive Test website. Corey just popped in. Uh, Bricks for Wheels, Corey is the moderator. Corey does a really great job of getting up videos that I recommend for you as well, so that's awesome. Okay, so get over here to the PowerPoint presentation. Transition, there we go. Crashes and accidents, and I tend not to call them accidents because 80 to 90 percent of crashes that occur on the roadway are attributable to driver error and in this day and age of distracted driving it tends to be much much more than that so what we're going to talk about today is the different types of crashes that you could be involved in essentially four types of crashes which are the four sides of the vehicle oddly enough and strategies techniques that you can put in place to prevent and reduce the risk of being involved in a traffic crash so that's what we're going to talk about today and again just to reiterate, this is the first lesson in the defensive driving course that I have available over at the Smart Drive Test website and you can get some really, really great information at a great uh, price over there. So for those of you who may be new to Smart Drive Test, my name is Rick August. I do have a PhD. I drove tractor trailers through most of the 1990s. In 1997, I became a licensed commercial driving instructor uh, with an expertise in air brakes. So I've been a driving instructor for almost 30 years now, I hate to say. <laughs> <laughs> it makes me sound really old. Uh, 2002, I moved to Australia and drove buses for Greyhound and one of the regional bus lines there. So I have experience with teaching people how to drive new, new drivers, uh, getting their first license, truck drivers, bus drivers, and as I said, air brakes as well. 2006, I graduated from the University of Melbourne with a doctorate in legal history. For those of you who may or may not know, it's the study of policing, courts, and prisons. And my expertise, oddly enough, is in policing as it relates to traffic. So the policing of traffic and how uh, police forces you know, have evolved over time and how that response has been to police and traffic and order maintenance and whatnot. So crash types, the four types of crashes are head-on crashes. T-bone crashes, rear end crashes, and side swipe crashes. These are the four types of crashes that you potentially could be involved in uh, when you're driving on the roadway. And the two crashes that tend to be the most fatal are head-on crashes. However, road engineering has greatly reduced the number of uh, head-on crashes that we experience on our roadways. And T-bone crashes, T-bone crashes are often fatal for passengers in the vehicle. And they often occur on left-hand turns. Uh, the driver misjudges the gap or gets pushed into the intersection and crashes into the door on the, on the passenger side of the vehicle. And because there is not very much metal there or vehicle there, uh, it tends to be quite fatal. And also because of the angle that the vehicle strikes your vehicle, all of the energy from the crash is concentrated on one small area of the vehicle. Okay, rear end crashes, often when you're sitting waiting to make a turn or sitting in traffic, you're gonna get rear ended. We'll give you some techniques and strategies to mitigate the risk for that as well. And then side swipe crashes, and side swipe crashes tend not to be uh, fatal unless you get hooked up in the other vehicle and then get spun around and get end up in a, in a front end crash. But for the most part, if it's two vehicles and a side swipe crash, it's not going to be fatal, but it can be depending on the trajectory of your vehicle after you impact with the other car or fixed object or whatnot. All right, so crashes, as I said in the introduction, are no accident, and I don't use the word accident. I either use crashes or collisions, bing, bingles, uh, bangs, and those types of things. Uh, a lot of traffic experts and a lot of uh, public awareness campaigns would lead you to believe that speeding is the number one cause for crashes and I disagree with this. I would argue that following too close and failing to manage speed are the number one reasons for traffic crashes uh, because if you're not near anything it's a lot less likely that you're going to hit something so if you manage speed well you're less likely to be involved in a crash. But these are the top three reasons for being involved in a collision, failing to yield, following too close. Failing to yield is, I got the right of way, I'm gonna go, it's my right of way. And people do not let up off the throttle and consequently risk being involved in a crash. Now, coming back to speeding, yes, Crashes occur because of speeding, but speeding does not lend itself to an easy definition. We often think, 
of speeding as exceeding the posted speed limit on the highway but you have to realize that posted speed limits on highways are simply the consensus of traffic professionals they get together and they decide that it's a highway or a road or whatnot and the speed limit should be set at say 80 kilometers an hour or 50 miles per hour but speeding has three or four different definitions uh, driving faster than me so for example you're driving down the road and somebody passes you and you go oh they're speeding because they're going faster than me even though you're following the traffic flow which is faster than the posted speed limit the posted speed limit faster than the traffic flow if you're speeding you're going faster than the traffic flow so say for example that the speed limit is 60 miles an hour everybody's driving along at 70 miles an hour on a big open multi-lane highway and then somebody passes you doing 80 miles an hour well now they're speeding and then the last definition that I would add to that is driving faster than the conditions of the roadway would allow so there's four different definitions of speeding depending on who you're talking to and how complicated you want to get with speeding all right so head-on crashes uh, here are some strategies if a head-on crash is imminent you want to move to the right okay always move to the outside for those of you in the world driving on the left side you want to move to the left always move to the outside of your lane don't try and deviate over to the other side of the lane because if you both drivers in the event of a hit on head on crash move to the outside of the, their lane it's less likely that they're actually going to collide the other thing you want to do in a head on crash is trying to reduce the energy in the vehicles and slow your vehicle as much as possible get on the brakes as hard as you can and try and slow that vehicle down to reduce the amount of energy in that projectile aim for something small don't drive towards the other car or hit the tractor trailer don't drive for a tree if there's a fence or a shrub or something like that aim for that aim for something that's soft something that's going to move because believe me you trucks trees they do not move rocks big rocks they don't move okay look for an out do not look at what you're going to hit look for an out where's your out and never 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 give up this is the other reason that we wear seat belts we don't wear seat belts <laughs> to protect us in the event of a crash we the first line of defense in wearing a seat belt is seat belts keep us in our seat if you're not in your seat you can't control the vehicle you can't work the steering wheel so wear your seat belt so that you stay in the driver's seat in the event of an emergency okay so head-on crashes often occur on two-lane roads passing often occur on left-hand turns uh, during a left-hand turn so you don't get pushed into a head-on crash keep your wheels straight you don't want to be a wreck on a wreck in the event that you get rear-ended because you don't want to be pushed into another vehicle uh, front head-on collisions t used to be fatal not so much now with airbags and seat belts and side impact bags and those types of things so vehicle automotive engineering has reduced the chances that you're going to be uh, killed in a in a head-on collision however think of quality of life are you going to be maimed are you going to lose a limb or something like that so you know you don't want to be involved in a head-on crash all right what else we got going on here okay and apologies my computer just did whatever it's doing it froze up on me I got the spinny wheel of death here on the screen as you can see so just bear with me for one sec here I think what happened was the drive fell asleep because that happens uh, unfortunately this drive is very expensive <laughs> but it does this there we go okay so the drive woke up there we go okay t-bone crashes and you can see here I'll just play this video for you this is a t-bone crash where the person is driving through and that is a t-bone crash where the vehicle struck the other vehicle on the side uh, at the door and before you proceed through an intersection look and look again okay do not proceed through an intersection like this the guy ran the red light didn't come to a complete stop and the other uh, vehicle and this camera angle is not very good if you actually look at this intersection on Google Maps uh, off to the left there it's completely wide open so there's no explanation of why that guy drove right through the red light uh, again it's early in the morning the driver may have been inebriated, may have been drunk, may not have been looking, may have been fatigued, driving home from a late shift or whatnot. There could be all kinds of reasons why that driver didn't scan that intersection or come to a stop before proceeding through the intersection. So, T-bone crashes can happen in both rural and urban areas. They're much more fatal at higher speeds, obviously. 
Uh, they're inherent at high risks in left-hand turns. And if there's passengers in the vehicle, as I said previously, it's often fatal to the passengers, all right? Rear end collisions, and these are not, this is not a crash you wanna be involved in. Uh, the vehicle does not protect you in the event of a rear end crash. They're not designed to protect you in the event of a rear end crash. Uh, a lot of people will call them headrests on the back of the vehicle. It's not a headrest, it's actually a head restraint, and it prevents your head from snapping back and giving you whiplash. However, in the event of a rear end crash, you are most likely going to sustain soft tissue damage. And talk to anybody who's been in a, in a crash and sustained soft tissue damage, which is basically muscles, tendons, and you know, that join the muscles to the skeleton in your body. These types of crashes are going, you're going to sustain long-term damage that will, will, is likely not to, not to heal, not to heal. Okay, so it often happens during stops and slowdowns. It results in whip, whiplash and soft tissue damage. When you're sitting at a light, stay back from the traffic in front of you. Don't be right up on the car in front of you because then you don't have an out. You need to manage that space. Observe to the rear, watch the mirror until traffic comes up behind you. Leave space in front of your vehicle. If you see a car coming up behind you and they're not coming, they're not slowing, they're not uh, coming to a stop, activate your four ways, tap your brakes to indicate to them because the flashing lights will get their attention and keep the vehicle moving forward. If you have that space in front, oftentimes if you move ahead that one vehicle length, that will prevent the T-bone or the rear end collision. All right, sideswipe crashes often occur on multi-lane roadways. These are less common than other types of crashes, but they do occur and often drivers overcorrect in the event of a side swipe crash they go oh my god and they freak out and they turn the steering wheel too far and it results in a much more serious crash uh, and Corey I'll put the video up for you on the crash analysis where people are doing this on freeways somebody merges the, the last second they see the other vehicle and they overcorrect and they slam into the wall or some other vehicle on the roadway or those types of things so side swipe crashes that's what happens tailgaters lots of uh, smart drivers comment on the channel about people that tailgate them and won't give them room and those types of things Simply increase your following distance and drive in the spaces between the gaggles on the highway for whatever reason Drivers like to drive in groups and they like to drive close together And it's a group and a group and a group and a group and a line down along the highway for three or four miles You want to try to drive in the spaces between the gaggles Manage the space around your vehicle. Create a living room in which you can manage space. If you have space around your vehicle, it's going to compensate when you have lapses in observation. For example, your attention gets caught on a billboard or something, you've got ample space in front of you and the vehicle, the traffic stops in front of you, well, you've got a buffer of space to protect you because you were distracted for a moment or whatnot. So do that as well, watch in your mirrors. Drive in the right-hand lane or the center lane if there's more than two lanes. That way you've got an out, and as well, you're not going to be impeding the flow of traffic or people who are in the fast lane, the big dollar lane, doing 30 miles an hour over the posted speed limit. I advocate this for people after you get your license. Do keep up with the flow of traffic. That way you're not an impediment, you're not unpredictable on the roadways, and you're not gonna be weaving in and out of traffic. If you insist on doing the posted speed limit, stay in the right-hand lane. But I will tell you right now, if you're on a two-lane road and you're doing the posted speed limit, you're gonna have a long line of cars behind you. And this is for people after you get your license, not when you're leading up to your license. And those people are gonna be passing, they're gonna be risking head-on crashes. Uh, when they risk head-on crashes, you could potentially be involved in that as a driver who's insisting on doing the speed limit. So no, so I encourage you, I counsel you, to keep up with the traffic flow after you get your license. And one place that you can always, always, always manage speed is in front of your vehicle. You can always manage the space to the front of your vehicle. So manage that well and keep a good buffer of space in front of your vehicle. Skid control. This is fairly easy. It, uh, it is unexpected and often takes you by control. You hit a bit of ice or whatnot. And there's a video here stopping on ice where I got caught out one day at an intersection. I had the dash cam on but I got out of the tracks and onto some traction and got the vehicle stopped. The worst thing that you can do in the event of a skid or your vehicle starts to go sideways is to get on the brakes. Get your foot off the brake because you have to keep the tires rolling. 
As soon as the wheels lock up, the vehicle is going to go out of control. So keep your foot off the brake, look where you wanna go, steer the vehicle. And you may have to steer the vehicle pretty ferociously in order to get it to come back around. So work pretty hard at it and don't give up. All right, living room, and I talked about this briefly previously, speed and space management. Manage the space around your vehicle by using the throttle, back off. And you can see here in the image, you can see this cluster I was talking about up here. You wanna be this green pickup truck back here because I can guarantee you behind this green pickup truck, there is another cluster of vehicles behind that green pickup truck. But this is where you wanna drive in the spaces between the clusters. Always, always leave yourself an out. Always control the space in front of your vehicle and have scanning patterns every eight to 12 seconds, excuse me. Look far down the road, look in, check your center mirror, far down the road, in, check your wing mirrors, far down the road, in, check your instrument panel, and then repeat that every eight to 12 seconds while you're driving, and that is going to keep you safe. Okay, so quick review of crashes, head-on crashes, T-bone crashes, rear-end crashes, side swipe crashes. Head-on crashes and T-bone crashes are often going to be fatal for occupants in the vehicle. And the other thing that I didn't say to you about traffic crashes is that there isn't just one crash it's not just the car hitting another vehicle or another fi or fixed object along the roadway and coming to a stop there's three crashes there's a car hitting something and coming to a stop there's you coming to a stop inside of the vehicle because remember if the car is traveling at 50 miles an hour you as well are traveling at 50 miles an hour so you have to come to a stop if you're wearing, you're fortunate enough, you're wearing your seatbelt, it's going to restrain you in the seat and you're gonna come up against the seatbelt and come to a stop. If this airbag is working properly, that as well will help to uh, dissipate the energy in your body as you're coming to a stop. And then finally, the last collision that occurs in the event of a front end collision or other types of collisions is your internal organs slamming up against your chest cavity. So know that, and that is often what causes internal bleeding and other serious injuries when you're involved in a crash. So there's three crashes that occur when you're involved in traffic crashes, particularly head-on crashes and T-bone crashes, which tend to be fatal. Rear end crashes, manage the space in front of your vehicle and be vigilant in your observation behind you when you're at a stop in traffic and there isn't traffic behind you because you will often sustain soft tissue damage, which goes on for some period of time. Some people I've heard complain about this for years and years. Sideswipe crashes tend to be less common <coughs> excuse me however in the event of a sideswipe crash many people many drivers will overcorrect and then they slam into a barrier or another vehicle or whatnot so they can be dangerous if you don't control yourself after you have the collision of sideswiping something else so that potentially could happen as well so good luck in your road tests keep safe minimize the risk of being involved in a crash and check out the defensive driving course over at the Smart Drive Test website. And remember, pick the best answer, not necessarily the right answer. So I'll head back over here and answer any questions you have about getting a license or staying crash free. Excellent. Mike, I'm 43 and just got my L and watched your videos that helped a lot. Excellent, so glad we could help out. Uh, Mike, where are you getting your license, uh, your learner's license there, Mike? All right, uh, Christina, am a victim fighting for my four-year-old child over two years. Okay, there's more story there, Christina, that I don't know. But anyway, if we, any we thing we can do to help out, that'd be great. Let us, let us know. We'll see what we can do for you. Presto, how do you know when you to correct for a skid when your car has electronic stability control? If electronic stability control, if you're working... If you're driving on slippery conditions, Presto, one of the things I would suggest to you is turn off traction control because traction control may or may not work against you. Uh, on dry pavement, good traction conditions, stability control is going to work well, okay? No doubt about it. However, if you're in slippery conditions, what's happening is as soon as you get wheel spin, on one tire, it's going to, depending on which vehicle you got, which vehicle you have traction control on, because it's going to work differently on different models of vehicles, it's going to transfer the power from one wheel to another wheel. So it's going to depend what kind of vehicle you have. My suggestion is that you turn traction control off when you're in slippery conditions. That way you're going to have 
more control over the vehicle when you're driving. Okay, David, you're most welcome. Okay, uh, Conceda, are winter tires worth it? Yes, if you are driving in winter conditions with snow and ice, winter tires are a must. However, if you're driving in a climate like Vancouver, British Columbia, or you're driving in Seattle or places like that, rain tires might be a better consideration for you to put on your vehicle. Now, Conceda, where are you in the world that you are considering winter tires or asking me about winter tires? Because the other thing that's happened is, is yes, the province of Quebec here in Canada has mandated that you have to have winter tires on your vehicle by a particular date, the 1st of October or whatnot. Here in British Columbia, they didn't, they weren't as uh, precise in terms of mandating winter tires on vehicles. But what they did here in the province of British Columbia is, is that if you're traveling on certain roads, certain map mountain passes, then you do have to have winter tires on your vehicle. So for example, if I was to head east from Vernon, go through Cherryville out to the cusp, I would have to have winter tires on my vehicle. If I was going over the Coquihalla, the mountain pass going to Vancouver, I would have to have uh, winter tires on my vehicle. Now, saying that winter tires are not winter tires per se. I have Michelin De Defender all season tires on the buggy. Those have a snowflake symbol on them. So as so long as your tires have snowflake symbols on them or they are M and S tires, mud and snow tires, then you're good to go in terms of winter tires and uh, being complicit with the law. But uh, if Casita, you're in Toronto. So Casita, Toronto doesn't get a lot of snow winter anymore. So you would probably be all right with good quality all season tires that have the snowflake or our M&S tires on the side of your vehicle. Uh, last year here, we had a couple of good months of really good winter. I don't drive the buggy a lot in the winter time. It's an all wheel drive vehicle. So as I said, I have uh, M&S tires, or sorry, I have, winter, I have the winter snowflake on my tires and they were just fine in the winter time. I mean, we have a mountain here that we have to get up to come into East Hill and I'm able to get up over that all the time. It's just fine. It's also going to depend on the vehicle that you have as well. If you have a rear wheel drive pickup truck, you are definitely going to put, want to put winter tires on it. But if you have an all wheel drive vehicle or you have a front wheel drive vehicle, then good quality uh, all season tires are going to work for you. So, and I know for a fact that a lot of people who are considering putting winter tires on their vehicle, it comes down to cost as well. I need to put winter tires on the buggy. It's probably going to cost me a thousand dollars. So it's not cheap. Okay. For sure. All right. Um, Epic, one more thing to avoid crashes on a green light without a left turn arrow is actually to wait for oncoming traffic to clear, uh, then proceed if there's a gap to appear. Yes, so Epic, as Epic says on left-hand turns, a lot of people misjudge the gap. And remember, you're gonna need eight to 12 seconds to make that left-hand turn, depending on how many lanes of traffic you're crossing when you're making a left-hand turn. So as I say in the judging the cap, gap video, which Corey will put up here for you, you need to get out and you need to start counting how far away traffic is from you when you're making those left-hand turns to determine that the gap is in fact sufficient for you to get around the corner without being T-boned. Uh, Nikita, how to manage if someone is tailgating you. So what you need to do, Nikita, when somebody is tailgating you is you need to increase the following distance in front of your vehicle because now you're not just driving for yourself but you're also driving for the goofball that's tailgating you behind if you're on a multi-lane road just slow down a little bit and they'll go around and pass you but if you're not if you're just on a single lane road going in one direction then you're going to need to increase the following distance in front because you don't want to make aggressive moves you don't want to make aggressive stops you don't want to make aggressive acceleration those types of things so you want to increase your following distance in front and then you know nice and easy on the brakes and those types of things as well. You could tap your brake lights to indicate that you're coming, you're gonna slow down or stop, and that will tell the people behind you uh, what you're doing, okay? Uh, it's me, I, I'm a new driver, got licensed in July, still very ner nervous to get on the freeways. Uh, it's me, what I would suggest is, is if you don't wanna get on the freeways right away, what I would suggest is do, do a bit more highway driving until you get more comfortable with that. When you get more comfortable with that, then go out on the freeway or interstate uh, and as well, uh, if you want to drive on the highways and freeways and whatnot, the other thing that you could consider doing 
is to get yourself a mentor, somebody who has some experience driving and whatnot and get out on the roadway and have them just to give you some pointers or suggestions about, you know, maybe increase your following distance, uh, more signals when you're turning and those types of things and they can really help you out to get more comfortable uh, when you're out on the interstates and freeways. Now know that, yes, you're traveling at higher speeds when you're on the interstates or freeways or whatnot, but it's much, much safer because all of the traffic is traveling in the same direction. You're not encountering oncoming traffic as you are in urban areas or whatnot. So the freeways and interstates are engineered specifically for higher speeds. They don't have intersections. They don't have slow moving vehicles. They don't have intersections. They simply have off ramps and on ramps. So it's a lot easier for you to be able to do that and drive on freeways and highways and those types of things. All right. Ajamo, as uh, studs needed for winter tires, are studded winter tires which better, which provide more? Okay, so you're in the New York State, Tri-State. Studded tires, I don't know if they're allowed in New York. Maybe one of the other smarter, smart drivers may be able to give me the information about whether studded tires are allowed in the Tri-State area in New York. Uh, I don't, they may or may not be, but yes, on ice, they are definitely much, much better. And here in British Columbia, studded tires are allowed between October and uh, the 1st of April. And they work exceptionally well on ice and snow because they actually dig into the ice and snow and give you really good traction. The problem with them is, is that when you're on dry pavement, A, they're incredibly noisy, and B, they, they're really hard on the roadways. So it, it depends on what's going on there in terms of studded tires or whatnot. But you need to figure out whether they're allowed in your state or not. Okay. Uh, hotline. Hey, I have my test in three days. Any advice? <laughs> yeah. Uh, that one I can't really help you with. Maybe keep a window down uh, while you're driving. <laughs> Christina, I just got my F driving license in the state of Missouri. Uh, State of Missouri, Christina, what is F? Is F a passenger vehicle or is that some sort of uh, CDL license? I'm not familiar with that class of license there in Missouri. All right, Muhammad, thank you. Your video is always helpful and the best. I watched your videos before taking my G2 and trust me, I got it very easily. Excellent, so you passed your first road test, Muhammad. That's awesome. So glad that we could help you out there in Ontario and that's great. Uh, vlog videos hello my friend how are you and again it's fairly busy here we got 40 50 people on the live stream so if you have a question and i don't get to your question just repost or just remind me and i'll go back and have a look because as i said there's lots of people on here lots of comments uh as well the other thing that'll help you stick out <laughs> is super chat we're always open to donations and greatly appreciated uh in supporting the channel and whatnot so uh that always helps out as well and uh as i said Today I was up actually doing some truck training, helping Jake out. He's got a road test in the morning and I felt really bad for him because the truck broke down <laughs> right in the test center off the parking lot and it was kind of sitting there and anyway, he, he's probably still working on it now trying to get another truck for the morning. So I felt bad for him for that. But anyway, I think he's gonna get it all sorted out and get his license in the morning. So that's really great. Uh, Sapphire Gaming, hey, my dad thinks he knows how to do, uh, you know, someone named Joe. Okay, Sapphire, not quite following that. <laughs> he knows me. Uh, do I know someone named Joe? Sapphire, I might. I mean, is he in British Columbia or Ontario or somewhere else? I mean, there's always a possibility I know your dad. Uh, Tommy, Rick, are you in favor of having seat belts in all school buses in the USA? Some states do have them in school buses, but others don't. I would think it might make a different uh, school bus crashes. One of the, one of the things, Tommy, is, is that you do not hear a lot about bus school bus crashes i mean if smart drivers are aware of school bus crashes or know of school bus crashes uh i don't know a lot of school bus crashes i i mean i'm always in favor of seat belts because seat belts keep people restrained in the event of a crash and a lot of people die in car crashes because they're not restrained in the vehicle and they get thrown around in the vehicle and as i said previously there's three crashes that occur when the vehicle crashes. It's the vehicle crashing, there's you crashing against the interior of the vehicle, and then there's your internal organs that are crashing against your chest cavity, which causes at high speed crashes and whatnot can cause internal bleeding and other serious injuries. So I'm always in favor of uh, seatbelts. 
and that was one of the one of the so here sort of buses in general not just school buses when I drove coaches in Australia all of the coaches had seat belts because in 1998 they had two serious bus crashes within a very short span of time within eight weeks one was in October and one was in early December the first bus crash was two bus our the first bus crash was a bus on a two-lane highway and they don't know whether the bus driver fell asleep or the truck driver fell asleep but essentially the bus or the truck came down sideswiped the bus and basically opened up the side of the bus like a sardine can and all the people were that were killed were on that side of the bus eight weeks later they had another serious bus crash except this time it was two highway coaches that collided head-on and people were killed in the buses and this is when they brought in all new safety regulations for buses how buses were manufactured and they also brought in seat belts in Australia so one of the safety announcements that I had to make when I was driving buses was is that wear your seat belt is required by law in the state of Victoria it's required by law in the state of New South Wales so I had to tell people that now I've been in discussions here in the province of British Columbia and other places in the states and whatnot where they're talking about wearing seat belts and the legislative challenge with implementing or mandating that seat belts are put on buses is, is that somehow in the way that the legislation is written the bus driver becomes responsible for people on the bus wearing their seat belt I know that's completely weird but this is one of the things that has prevented us putting seat belts on buses especially on school buses because how do you ensure that all of the children on the bus are wearing their seat belt does the bus driver become responsible for those children wearing seat belts on the bus therein lies the question therein lies the legislative challenge and not only that whenever you put legislation in place you put law in place who's going to police that is that going to be the DOT is that going to be any other commercial authority the CBSE the MTO whatnot or is it going to be the regular police forces so there's therein lies all the questions okay uh, Christina so Christina got her full license in the state of Missouri that is absolutely awesome congratulations Christina that's really great news Carrie uh, in snow and ice conditions what is the best way to determine the correct speed to drive for any road conditions and how much to drive under speed limit as speed limit is for ideal conditions okay so Carrie one of the things you want to do is if you are on snow and ice first and foremost and as well <laughs> talking about winter tires talking about driving in winter conditions and whatnot you can pick up the winter driving course over at the smart drive test website for $27 it's on sale from its regular price so you can save 30 percent on the winter driving course I will talk about in that course and I'll talk a little bit about it now when are the most dangerous times to drive in the winter time and the most dangerous time to drive in the winter time is when there's snow on the roadway and the temperature is around freezing it's around zero degrees Celsius or it's around 32 degrees Fahrenheit because what happens in the winter time on ice and snowy conditions is that when the temperature is around zero the snow and ice is melting and freezing melting and freezing melting and freezing and you get a layer of water on top of it think of ice cubes when you pull them out of the freezer when you pull them out immediately they're sticky right but after 30 seconds after a minute this the ice cube becomes very slippery because it melts and there's a layer of water on top of it and that's what lubricates the ice think of ice hockey uh, rinks immediately after the Zamboni goes out that's when the ice is the most slippery so in the winter time uh, what Carrie is asking me here is how do you know how fast to drive and when is it the most slippery it's going to be the most slippery when the temperature is around zero so figure out in the morning we all have phones in this day and age that all have weather apps on them so when you get up in the morning have a look at the weather have a look at what the temperature is outside if it's around zero it's much more treacherous to drive than it is when it's minus 20 in Minnesota or North Dakota because when it's minus 20 ice and snow is sticky and you most likely have winter tires on your vehicle that are going to get provide you with good traction now when you go out in the winter time carry you want to do a test so you get out on the roadway you're doing the speed limit tap the brakes a couple of times obviously you're making sure what's behind you and what traffic is behind you and whatnot but just tap the brakes and test the conditions of the roadway and as well when you come up to an intersection in the winter time 
break way back, two blocks back from where you actually want to stop and then creep up to where you want to stop. That way when you get to where you want to stop and it is slippery, you're going to come to a stop at the spot you want to come. You don't want to get up right to where you want to stop and then like, oh my God, it's too slippery, I'm not going to stop. So sl stop back from the intersection and then creep up to where you actually want to stop. As well as it, if, if it is slippery out, keep your vehicle in a straight line. Don't be doing abrasive turns and those types of things because that's when you're going to lose control of the vehicle. All right, abrupt, how are you? Epic, uh, speaking of Jersey, studded tires are permitted for use between November 14th and April the 1st. Excellent, okay, so that's as it goes here in British Columbia as well. To avoid collisions and left turns without green arrows, wait for the traffic gap, then go, rather than, yes, you definitely are going to be at high risk of a T-bone crash in a left-hand turn if you misjudge the gap, all right? Muhammad, I always drive on the highways to work with my G2 and will be taking my G test next month. I do need to take a driving instructor before taking the G test. Yes, and that's what I counsel, Muhammad. That's excellent that you're going to take a practice driving test with a driving instructor because they'll be able to give you feedback about your driving and indicate which skills and abilities may need to be strengthened for the purposes of being successful and passing your road test. All right. Ojoma, thanks for the answer. I'm in New Jersey. Studs are legal, as yes, as Epic said. And by the way, my name is pronounced o Ojomo. Okay, thank you. I'm a CDL driver. Excellent, awesome. And but you won't have. Um, so just as a note, CDL vehicles do not have studs for the most part. Uh, some of the school buses, fire trucks, and whatnot will have automatic chains on them. I don't know whether you uh, people are familiar with these, but Think of a ceiling fan. So essentially what happens is they have a mechanism that it's, it's a round disc like this, like this CD here, and there's chains that hang off this, like this. And so what happens is that when you engage this, it's on a gear that's connected to the wheel, so it spins at the same revolutions per minute as the tire on the outside of the vehicle. And as this spins, obviously the chains come out on a vertical motion and it throws them no, this way, so the vehicle's going this way, for example. It throws the chain underneath the tire as it moves forward. So this spins like a ceiling fan underneath the vehicle and throws the chain under the tire. So they're called automatic uh, chains. So if you're driving a school bus or whatnot, they will have uh, chains, automatic chains underneath them. And some of the fire trucks will have them as well. All right. Christina, thank you so much for that. Awesome. Uh, Mike? I am blind in one eye. Uh, any help on when I do shoulder checks and not move the steering wheel? Any exercises to do that try? Excellent. Yes, so Mike, one of the challenges that you're going to have with having just vision in one eye is you're going to have reduced, uh, you're not going to have any depth perception. So obviously you're making compensations for that and whatnot. Shoulder checks, one of the reasons that the steering wheel moves, and this isn't just for Mike, this is for all drivers. The reason that the steering wheel moves when you're doing shoulder checks is because you're doing them too slowly. You're going like this, and you're bringing your head back. And when you when you do that, when you do this lolly gag shoulder check like this, what happens is, is that the vehicle goes where you're looking. This is for everybody, CDL drivers, passenger vehicle drivers, everybody. The vehicle goes where you're looking. So when you're looking over here, this is what happens, okay? So shoulder checks, Spot, look down the road forward, hold the steering wheel, quick shoulder check, and back forward. All you're looking for is you're using your peripheral vision because peripheral vision in a healthy adult is 180 degrees. Uh, it's not going to be the same okay, when you have vision impairment, but in a healthy adult, it's 180 degrees. It's out here. okay. So you're simply moving your peripheral vision over here. Your vision is attracted to light and movement. So essentially what you're looking for is lighter movement, something over here in your shoulder check. And then if there is something there, then you can further investigate. But it's unlikely that's gonna happen because you need to do two shoulder checks when you're doing a turn or moving the vehicle sideways. So as you're coming up in preparation to do a turn, <coughs> excuse me, approximately half a block before the turn, you're gonna shoulder check, there's nothing there, there's nothing in front of you as you're approaching the intersection. And as you get right up on the intersection, unless conditions change quickly, you just shoulder check, there's nobody there again, and you go. Okay, so it's quick 90 degree turn of the head. Most people, when they tell me that, as soon as I tell them to speed up their shoulder checks, it fixes the problem and they're good to go. All right, uh, there's the winter driving course. Corey got that up for you, excellent. Okay, 
Crystal, I had my license since age 23. I'm now 28 now and still have not driven con consistently. I have kids and I'm nervous to drive alone with my kids in the car. What are some ways I can feel better about it? Okay, so Crystal, one of the things you wanna do to overcome that anxiety and trepidation is practice on low density roads. Practice in the morning, practice in the evening when there isn't much other traffic around. Uh, go out onto rural streets or those residential streets or whatnot and just practice your backing up and those types of things. As well, if you can get a hold of some of those 36 inch, one meter tall pylons or delineators and go down to the parking lot, work on some of your slow speed maneuvers, that's going to Im tremendously increase your awareness of where the vehicle is in space and place. It's gonna give you mastery of the primary controls, the steering wheel, the brake, the throttle, and gonna help you out in terms of moving your vehicle around. And then finally, the other, uh, strategy that I suggest to new drivers who have some anxiety around driving by themselves is to take somebody with you, your mom, your dad, your uncle, a friend uh, who has a license and has some experience driving and then they can give you some pointers and those types of things and they can say, you know, okay, and you're going to go on a left-hand turn and you misjudge the gap or what, and they can say, no, 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 don't go just yet, you don't have enough gap. Because teaching somebody about gap as i said in the in the video on how to determine gap is something that is experiential and if you can get help from somebody else or a driving instructor or whatnot and i mean that's another possibility as well crystal is is that you might get uh, you might hire a driving instructor save a few dollars and hire a driving instructor for an hour and get them to go out and just give you some tips and techniques and strategies that you can put in place to overcome your anxiety but you just you want to get in the vehicle you want to you know just go and sit in the vehicle for five or ten minutes as well and Corey will put the video up for you on uh, reducing fear and anxiety when you're driving as well and that'll help you out okay uh, Sunday mentor there you go okay uh, rusty cooking I had the worst luck with my driver's test hit the curb while parking in the spot so failed at the last second no you didn't fail rusty cooking cooking you were simply unsuccessful and you're definitely gonna get it on the next one, okay? So what I would suggest to you is, uh, get again, get some of those 36 inch, one meter tall pylons and, and go down to the parking lot, do some work uh, with learning where your vehicle is in space and place, get some mastery of the primary controls and all of that is gonna help you out so you're gonna be successful in your road test. Uh, the other thing I might suggest, Rusty Cooking, is uh, maybe book a practice driving test with a local driving instructor and that will be able to help you out as well. Uh, <laughs> Sunday yes excellent thank you Sunday yes and that was my answer get a mentor somebody else who's got some experience and that will help you out uh, regular car tires not commercial vehicles but I appreciate the information just wanted to mention my CDL worked hard for it yes anybody who has a CDL <laughs> works hard for their CDL so congratulations on having that as well and anybody going for a road test uh, as I said the practice our passion road test first time is on sale over the smart drive test website and four components of passing a road test depending it doesn't matter where you are in the world doesn't matter how old you are what vehicle you're going for what class of license all road tests have the same four components speed management space management observation and communication space management if you don't get near anything on the roadway it's less likely you're going to hit something so space management three stopping positions at an intersection before the stop line before the crosswalk or sidewalk and if those two conditions don't exist at the edge where the two roads meet the stop sign the position of the sign itself has nothing to do with where you stop at an intersection when you stop in traffic and this is defensive posturing for the purposes of staying safe and not being rear-ended when you stop in traffic Stop so you can see the tires in front of you making clear contact with the pavement. Your following distance must be two to three seconds in a passenger vehicle. In a CDV, CDL vehicle, it has to be more for the purposes of managing space when you're driving for the purposes of a road test. Do not drive into an intersection that you cannot clear on a road test. If you drive into an intersection and block the intersection, it's an automatic fail on a road test. Speed management, you have to drive the posted speed limit or the flow of traffic whichever is less and get the vehicle up to speed as quickly as possible don't dawdle because you can be dinged on a road test for driving too slow as much as you can be for driving too fast and smart drivers ask me again and again about 
uh, you know, how much am I allowed to go over the speed limit or how much am I allowed to go less? It's not a matter of if you're allowed to go over the speed limit or less, it's how much you are off and for how long. So if you're like the whole road test, you're driving five miles an hour over the posted speed limit, you're definitely gonna fail. But if you drive five miles an hour over the posted speed limit for 20 seconds, and you look down at the instrument panel and all of a sudden you adjust your speed back to the posted speed limit, you're gonna be fine because it ties into observation when you're driving. You need to have a scanning pattern in place that you are going through every eight to 12 seconds. You need to be looking far down the road and then you come in, you look at, check the wing mirror, far down the road, in, check the instrument panel, far down the road, in, check your wing mirrors, far down the road, and then you're repeating that pattern every eight to 10 seconds. And this is going to help you with speed control when you're driving the vehicle. And it's going to take a lot of practice when you're driving for speed control because you have to drive the posted speed limit and everybody else on the roadway is driving at the flow of traffic which is going to be anywhere from 8 to 15 miles an hour above the posted speed limit depending on which roadway you run so you are definitely the odd duck out on the roadway driving the posted speed limit and then finally uh, communication you need to communicate effectively with other road users on your road test you need to use your lights and signals uh, to indicate turns and whatnot use your horn use your horn sparingly though uh, eye contact if you got a cyclist or somebody who's coming out on a corner or whatnot you need to get eye contact with them to ensure that they're not going to step out in front of you uh, hand gestures make sure you use all five fingers <laughs> tell them you're number one on a road test because you won't be successful for the purposes of a road test and then finally the position of your vehicle on the roadway communicates intent of what you're going to do it's a very high percentage that if a vehicle is in a left-hand turning lane that vehicle, that driver is going to be turning left. And just on that uh, that note of position of the vehicle on the roadway, I have many, many, many comments about drivers that are talking about getting on freeways. Probably one of the most daunting tasks for new drivers changing lanes and getting on freeways. If you are getting out to the halfway point of the on-ramp on the freeway and the traffic is backed up, it's, it's you know morning rush hour or whatnot and people aren't letting you over, you've had your signal on coming down the ramp and you get onto the acceleration lane uh, and you got your signal on and people aren't letting you in and creating a space and helping you out and those types of things, crowd the left side of your lane. For those of us who drive on the right, crowd the left side of the lane. For those of you who drive on the left side, crowd, you crowd that side of the lane where the traffic is not letting you in. Because I guarantee you, as soon as you move over and you start crowding that left side of the lane, they're gonna open up, they're gonna create a space for you. Because you're both, create, you're crowding that so they think you're coming over, plus this light is, let me in, let me in, let me in. It just keeps flashing and flashing and flashing and flashing. Eventually, they're gonna let you over, okay? So I get that question again and again. So know that the position of your vehicle on the roadway is critical for communicating intent of what you're going to do. So again, just quick review. Speed management, space management, observation, communication. Those are the four components of any road test regardless of class, regardless of where you are in the world, and regardless of how old you are. If you've got those four pieces in place, you are going to be successful on a road test. Edgar, how are you, my friend? Crystal, you're most welcome. Uh, Carrie, what is a safe way to practice not braking during, before a skid, using steering to gain traction? In dangerous situations, it is such a gut reaction to hit the brakes. Yes, but you have to carry you need to practice that. And maybe the best way to practice that is to go to a parking lot when you get a bit of snow with the pylons and work on not reacting by touching the brakes. And the other thing, Carrie, that ties into that, and that's an excellent point about you've got this natural reaction to hit the brakes, but that is part of being a novice driver. If you can manage space around your vehicle, it's less likely you're going to have to hit the brakes. And what I encourage new drivers to do, both passenger vehicles and CDL vehicles, is to work the throttle. Because if you can control the speed, you can manipulate the speed of your vehicle, you can control the space around your vehicle. Instead of hitting the brakes, just let off the throttle and back off. And if you have a good buffer of space in front of your vehicle, you can do that. Because you, have, you can drive up a little bit and then back off a little bit and move up and, and it's kind of ebb and flow of the traffic and you managing that space around your vehicle. 
That way you're going to be less likely to use the brakes and hit the brakes in an emergency situation. Uh, Presto, just drove my dad to the store, sitting in the parking lot waiting for him now. I've got to get all the experience I can get. And yes, that is excellent what Presto is doing, <laughs> sitting on his phone in the parking lot waiting for his dad. But I say this to students, get your L, get your N, drive as much as you can. I was having a discussion with a friend of mine the other day. His son is 16, got his license, and he's in his learner's phase. And he is reluctant to drive, and he's got to force him to drive all the time. If you want to be successful, if you want to pass your road test first time, when you're in your learner's phase, take every opportunity you can to drive the vehicle, even if it's just driving your mom or dad to the liquor store to get a box of beer, or driving to the grocery store or the doctor's office or whatnot. Get as much experience as you can driving a vehicle, driving different kinds of vehicles, driving with different people, uh, driving in different weather conditions, on roadways and those types of things. If grandpa and grandma need a ride, give them a ride, drive the vehicles, because the more experience you can get, the better driver you're going to be and you're going to greatly reduce your chances of being involved in a traffic crash which is what we're talking about today uh, Michael right I did that on my first test blocked the left side when I was about to drive out of the parking lot to the Yup Road I'm sure part of it was a flustered after the letdown in the parallel park and yes that sometimes happens as well but you need to keep going and I'm hoping that's what my friend Jake is gonna do there in Salmon Arm today with the truck breaking down I'm hoping he's gonna be able to pull it together because I know that's really kind of freaking him out that he doesn't have a vehicle for his road test in the morning, but I'm hoping he was able to get by that and can get another vehicle and get on with his road test and be successful in passing that. Uh, Tommy, have you done a video about driving through a work zone yet? Uh, if not, you should put it on your list of videos to do. Yes, definitely we'll put that on my list of videos. There is a bit of information, uh, uh, Tommy rather, have a look at the video on how to determine right of way and look down in the description there for the different topics for that video and there is uh, some information about construction zones there it's not actually me driving through a construction zone and sort of pointing out all of the things that you need to look at or consider when you're driving through a construction zone but definitely there is some information about determining right of way in that video all right, so we're getting near the end here. We're, I think we're just going to wrap up now. And thank you, everybody, for participating. Thank you for all your comments. Again, check out Pass Your Road Test First Time course over at the Smart Drive Test website. And check out the Winter Driving and Defensive Driving courses. They're over there as well. And we'll really give you some great information as we're heading into winter here and adverse driving conditions and we'll help you out. And as I was saying to one driver the other day who was asking me about the Winter Driving course, if I did in-vehicle stuff, the the problem with in-vehicle stuff, it is definitely helpful and will help you out, but when it comes to winter driving, you already know how to drive all the vehicle, and if you go out with a driving examiner in your vehicle to learn winter driving, conditions on the roadway may not give you all the different information that you might need for winter driving. It may not be slippery, there may not be freezing rain, you may not be driving in the night, those types of things. But the winter driving course and the defensive driving course give you all that different information and that information is going to mitigate the risk of you being involved in a crash or sliding off the road into the ditch in the winter time and potentially damaging your vehicle or sustaining an injury. So that's what we're trying to do with those courses and help you out. As well, if you do sign up for those courses, you have unfettered access to me, a licensed driving instructor who will be able to help you out and keep you safe on the roadways. So for everybody that's passed a road test in the last couple of weeks, congratulations on passing a road test. For those of you who have a road test coming up in the next week or so, good luck on that. And remember, pick the best answer, not necessarily the right answer. Have a great night. Bye now.